I am Shannon Haddock, and I am a library specialist at the Hoover Library. And uh, if you don't know Hoover, you know, you should check out our library above anything else. Um, I'm pretty uh, good at bragging on the Hoover Library, and I'm so excited. We'll start getting back to in-person programming sometime late July and August. So uh, that's a plug for in-person programming. I'm still gonna continue doing Zoom programs because I love bringing you some diverse people that can, you know, that live far away. So uh, look for our calendar on our website and uh, keep track of our in-person and Zoom meetings. And um, today, uh, the title kind of tells you everything, fairy tales retold. My vision for this is to find someone who could talk about uh, what I see as kind of an upsurge in people retelling old tales, um, especially when it comes to adult fiction and YA fiction, uh, the basic Snow White premise, but time. Things like that are fascinating to me. Uh, I've read quite a bit myself, and I know that our speakers today have also. I will put together a um, bibliography and resource list that I will email probably in the morning to everyone so that you have them. Uh, I will also include a lot of resources that are here at the Hoover Library and give you a link to just go check them out. So our first, the first person I touched base with was Carrie Madden Lunsford and is from California. Thank you so, so much, Carrie. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Creative Writing at UAB. So I think she spends her time, am I right, between California and Alabama. Uh, she should know better, but California with no air conditioning. You're from, you know, if you live in Alabama, you know what's good for you, girl. Air conditioning is much for joining us. She has a book coming out, is a picture book, Ernestine's Milky Way, published by Random House Studios in 2019. She has many other books. I think you've done at least a biography, a couple of other, and a novel very uh, prolific writer. We're also joined today with by Anna Maria Santiago. Hello. Um, she is an instructor also in the Department of English at UAB. Now, Anna Maria does, um, oh, I'm trying to find where her thing is. She specializes in 20th and 21st century American literature. Um, and uh, she can talk more about that, but she's got lots of specialties and fair tales have her interest. And she's also hey. a, a, a very active uh, community. Oops, there we go. I muted someone. One of, you know, knitting and crocheting is my other past, my other life. And, and third, Perna Dwivedi, who is also an instructor at UAB's Department of English. Now, she, interestingly enough, teaches full time the regular core curriculum and the history of witches. You know, what, I, what she has to say is going to be interesting. Um, you know, she's, she's mostly of gender, you know, in the world of witches and how the narratives are come about. And it's very interesting to me, and I can't wait to hear her. Now, um, I'm going to start off, I think, by handing it over to Anna Maria. So, uh, I will try to guide the conversation. If you have any questions, feel free. You could put them in chat or you can do your little, you can raise your hand, things like that. We're very casual tonight. So I hope that you'll join in on the conversation. 
Anna Maria, can you tell us about what you're writing now? Or is it is something in the works? Oh, yeah, something's in the works. I'm an unpublished aspiring author, a children's um, book writer in middle grade. Um, so I'm working on a middle grade novel right now, um, kind of um, top secret, but it does, it is kind of based on um, mythology, especially that from um, the native peoples of Puerto Rico, where my family's from. So um, anyway, so the, I am working on, on that, but um but yeah, do you want me to go ahead and get started? Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, great. So um, one of my favorite courses to teach, well, two of them are my comics and graphic novel course and my um, a course I call Minding Make Believe. And in that course, um, we study children's and uh, middle grade works of fiction um, and poetry as well. Um, but um, in that class, I have a unit on fairy tales. So um, I really enjoy that unit. <laughs> I'm not as much of an expert as some of the others on this call, but I do um, really enjoy it and students really enjoy unpacking fairy tales. Um, so um, what I'm gonna talk about today um, before passing it on uh, to Carrie and Aparna is kind of um, just at its basis, like why fairy tales have such broad appeal to us culturally and throughout the ages um, and kind of universally fairy tales are you know found all over the world um, so but first if you would in the chat um, define what a fairy tale is in your words how would you define fairy tale that's a great question yeah a magical story with a moral yeah, I love that. Okay, so we've got something in the fantastical or magical realm, but that kind of morality there, stories that have lasted the ages, archetypes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about archetypes a little bit here I and mean, answering those big questions, kind of those existential questions of what it means to be human, stories past cult, uh, culture. Oh, hi, Emma Fox. <laughs> stories of wonder told by a culture to pass along core values and beliefs, magical stories narratives. Okay, or explain, hey Cheryl, to explain um, natural occurrences, fantastical, cultural myths, perfect. Yeah, this is lovely. Um, so there are some trends here in your definitions, right? There are some overlaps that I'm seeing. Um, and all of those kind of are kind of melded into the way I think about fairy tales. Um, so fairy tales come from oral tradition, right? So they come from folk tale. Um, so they come from this kind of sharing of um, stories that um, have a lot of functions. They offer imaginative release or wish fulfillment, right? I wish I were a royalty, right? I wish I were a princess. Um, but they also kind of recognize anxieties, right? Or, um, or fears and confront them in interesting ways. Um, and um, I think Carrie mentioned the archetype, right? So they they do seem, the reason why they seem to have such wide appeal is that they're kind of speaking to something that young, um, young the, you know, psychoanalyst would say is kind of innately human, right? Kind of our, the way that we're kind of interpreting the world, how our, you know, how the evolution of our psyche has tried to interpret what the world means. Um, and we kind of transfer those archetypes onto the symbols we see in the stories that come up in fairy tales that come up over and over and over again. Like Aparna, we'll talk about the witches later. <laughs> you know, so we have these kind of tropes that we see over and over and over again that speak to something about our hopes or fears. Um, so, one thing I enjoy talking about with students is how fairy, uh, I love our talk is like talking about adult fairy tales, right? Fairy tales redult, uh, retold in the adult lens. Um, but my students are often surprised to note that early fairy tales were not for children. Like they were always adult. So um, it, there's there was a shift around, well, you know, there are a lot, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of being really Western centric when I'm talking about this kind of trajectory timeline. It's, you know, wasn't the same all over the world, but when we think of like Western literary tradition, um, around the Victorian age is when we start seeing um, people really packaging fairy tales for children specifically. There were still some people who were like, oh, no fairy tales, even for, no, kids don't even need fairy tales. It's not good for them. Um, but the there's often a lot of like, 
the earlier ver versions of these fairy tales are really raunchy. I just want to share with you a couple of, um, of early fairy tale um, kind of iterations. And my favorite one to talk about with my students is Little Red Riding Hood. I like that story for a number of reasons. One, because it's kind of a departure from a lot of the other ones that have um, um, women as the main character, right? Where usually they're a royalty, they're a princess um, or, you know, something like that. But Little Red is just a random girl who's walking, <laughs> usually walking to her grandmother's house. She's not um, really, you know, of any high standing. Um, although I'll talk to you about class and fairy tales in, in one second, but, um, but okay. So, there are so many versions of Little Red, um, and she's a character that we continue to revisit even today um, in lots of different ways. So um, let's see. I'm trying not to be lectury. <laughs> I have like a PowerPoint that I use for my students, but I, I don't want to, but I do want to, I'm going to share some images. Um, but so one of the earlier um, versions of Little Red Riding Hood that was written down. Again, remember these were oral traditions. So I know um, a scholar of Grimm's fairy tales was here a year ago or something like that, um, who would know way more about this than I do. But I do know that, um, you know, Grimm's and Perot, um, they didn't come up with these stories. Even Hans Christian Andersen, you know, didn't make them up. Um, you know, they, they heard these stories or they sought them out to, to you know, collect them in these books. But one of the earliest ones that we have written down um, is Paul Delarue's The Story of Grandmother. Um, mostly the name is not Little Red until we get to Perot. Um, he's the one who coined the Little Red and I'll talk about him in a second. But um, Paul Delarue's story um, is a very cannibalistic story. So I'm not, y'all know the basic story, but Little Red goes to grandmother's house. Wolf has already eaten her, um, but also has collected some of grandmother's blood in a, in a jar. And then also has like collected some of her body parts and, um, Little Red eats it, not knowing. Um, so Wolf as grandmother's like, here, drink this, here, eat this. So she's cannibalizing her grandmother, um, in the story. And, um, and then she's told, um, get naked and get into bed, throw your clothes in the fire. So she does, so she gets in there. And then, you know, at some point she realizes as Little Red tends to do, um, something's not right here. Um, so how she gets out of it is she's like, I need to use the bathroom. And so um, she goes to try to use the bathroom and he ties something to her leg and she escapes. Okay, um, so then, <laughs> then we get to, um, another version, uh, which is called the false grandmother. This one's so interesting to me because it's Cal it's um, Italo Calvino, and the villain is not a wolf; it's an ogress. So this is the first version I've seen where the villain trying to kill Little Red is a is a female character, um, and the same story happens where she's like, you know, I'm going to eat you, get into bed, um, and um, the same thing. She says, I need to use the restroom, and that's she's like, okay, hurry up, go downstairs and use the bathroom, um, and then come right back. Um, but she ties the rope to a goat and escapes or whatever. So that's another weird version. All right, I'm still I'm still getting to the <laughs> to the more raunchy, raunchy, raunchy stuff. But then we get to Charles Perrault, although cannibalism I think is pretty raunchy um, where we start the story. Um, but Perrault is where we get the Red Riding Hood. And so he's um, this French kind of bureaucrat who um, writes these stories for an aristocratic audience. So here we start seeing the story shift for uh, you know these stories that were folk tales told among the peasants now are being kind of packaged for the aristocracy, and so those kind of um, middle and upper class morals are being kind of put into the the story a little bit more. Um, so that Red Riding Hood is something Perot coins. Um, there's not a, a Red Riding Hood before him, um, but that red, that raunchy red, right? That's kind of a, a sexual taboo color, which is what Little Red's all about. At the bottom line, I'm telling you these versions because in all of them, there's a sexual or uh, undertone, right? And I think in most versions, the wolf is not a wolf, <laughs> but um, I'm gonna share with you the moral in Perot's story so you can kind of see how he interprets the wolf. Um, so this is from a PowerPoint that I use. So, um, so at the end of Perot's ver a version, oh, and in this version, she um, is not saved, she's eaten up and is devoured and that's the end. We end with Little Red being eaten up, 
no one comes to save her. Um, but then we have this moral. Um, children, especially pretty nicely brought up young ladies, ought never to talk to strangers. If they are foolish enough to do so, they should not be surprised if some greedy wolf consumes them, elegant red riding hoods and all. Now there are real wolves with hairy pelts and enormous teeth, but also wolves who seem perfectly charming, sweet natured and obliging, who pursue young girls in the street and pay them the most flattering attentions. Unfortunately, these smooth tongued, smooth pelted wolves are the most dangerous beasts of all. So here pretty explicitly, he points out, hey, um, this wolf is, a, is a, you know, this is a symbol for a man who is trying to take advantage of this girl sexually. Um, and that's the story in many of the versions. Um, so we can see some il how illustrations of these early books um, indicate kind of the innocence of Little Red in contrast with her. Um, but as we get more contemporary in the 70s and 80s, especially with um, you know, feminism, which I know that um, Aparna and um, Carrie are gonna talk about that in a little bit, we see versions where it becomes more explicitly real, um, like reality, um, real people, real men, um, real little girls. Um, then <laughs> we get to people like Angela Carter in 1979, The Company of Wolves, where she completely subverts the trend. Uh, it's still very sexual, but when Wolf says, all the better to eat you with, Little Red, or the girl, burst out laughing. She knew she was nobody's meat. She laughed at him full in the face, ripped off his shirt, um, and flung it into the fire in the fiery wake of her own discarded clothing. Um, so Little Red uh, in this story is not a victim at the end. She in turn is the sexual kind of being who kind of is taking charge of the situation. Um, and so we see that kind of in the 70s and 80s, a lot of role reversal in the storytelling where um, we get more agency in the women characters. And of course, this is just Little Red as an example, but that happens in a lot of the retellings. Um, and also I think postmodernism or modernism has something to do with it too, where villainy is not black and white. Um, we're really interested in the psychology of characters, um, of, of villains too. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to go through that just to show you that those early themes in Little Red Riding Hood um, are really explicit and not things maybe you would read to little kids now. Um, so they, they were always had these adult themes. Um, and um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things before I pass it on because I think that's almost my time, um, that um, there are several comic books who are taking these um, characters. I know, I think primarily today we're gonna talk about um, full length novels, but um, there's like Fables, Legends of Exile. This It's a series, it's a comic series um, that takes these characters and brings them into our world and how they would live today. Um, and if, you know, if we have time later on, we can talk more about that. Um, and then uh, I know Carrie's going to mention Hamnet. Um, so, um, you know, there are lots of, you know, Shakespeare is one of those enduring, you know, he, you know, calls to those archetypal, you know, feelings as well, I think. Um, and there's lots of retellings of him. And um, another comic that speaks to that is, um, it's an older comic, um, but Sandman um, by Neil Gaiman. Um, one of my favorite issues is A Midsummer Night's Dream. And in it, he talks about the relationship between um, uh, William Shakespeare and Hamnet. And um, also he's calling to all these other kind of mythological and fantastical realms too. He's talking, um, the Longman of Wil Wilmington, do y'all know the, it's like the chalk guy and I think Sussex in the UK, mm. like we don't know where it came from, like why it's there. Um, but that's like a doorway into the world where Oberon and Titania uh, live and, um, and Puck lives and it opens up and um, anyway, it's really cool. I okay. Think so um, Anna Maria might say um, the Fable series is hugely popular here, and I think you're right with with the advent of the, and acceptance of graphic novels with adults. It's just gone gone mad, you know. At, there are so many wonderful illustrators bringing these things into sometimes terrifying worlds. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's so fascinating. And I, um, I'm, I'm going to pass it off to, um, to Aparna, but, um, I, but yeah, but I love, I'm also like a student of pop culture because I think it's, mm -hmm. um, understudied in some ways in academia, but, you know, I mean, think about things like Shrek and other fun things that are just retellings of fairy tales for, in it, for our, our day and age, our, you know, thinking of it, there are lots of, um, 
TV shows now that are, you know, using these stories um, and changing them. A lot of TV lot. series <laughs> that are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Aparna. Let me unmute myself. Yes. Um, uh, so let me begin by um, talking about the class that I teach. Um, and this is my sixth time or seventh time teaching it this summer. Um, it was, um, I was surprised that nobody had thought of teaching it before. Uh, the class is called Witch Narratives. And uh, what we do is we study uh, the depictions of witches uh, from, um, so every semester it takes on a new form. Um, and our interest is in studying um, the narrative form itself, who gets to tell the story, whose story gets told, in whose power is it to shape some, somebody's story, why one needs to take ownership of one's own story. So we are actually really talking about stories, which is are simply our means of uh, talking about this. So while we study very specific witches, like um, we study uh, Tituba, the Black Witch of Salem, and uh, we trace her narrative through history from the Salem Witch Trials, and all those documents are now publicly available. So students have a great time looking at the historical narrative and then looking at subsequent depictions of Tituba. And so we come to Crucible, and many of them are, you know, their, their first acquaintance with Tituba is from Crucible. And, or, um, and then we go on to study um, Maurice Conde's uh, novel, I, Tituba, which was written in French and then translated in English. And um, so that is just one example. Now, uh, our main texts in this semester are um, what we call Witch, um, Witches Abroad by Terry Pratchett. And I bring it up not because I want to talk about witches, but because the entire plot is based on a mixture of fairy tales. And it is fascinating the way he mixes all the fairy tales together as though they're all the same. Uh, you know, they basically have the same elements and you have this protagonist who largely is a damsel in distress and there is the event where she is um, um, deprived in some form of what she thinks she, of what she deserves. And then there is, um, there is the evil stepmother. And that is our point of interest in fairy tales. Um, the evil queen or the evil stepmother, whether it be in Cinderella or in um, uh, Snow White. And those are the two uh, fairy tales that are of our prime interest because um, from my um, teaching of this class over time, I've come across uh, the numerous versions of these two specific fairy tales. And so the one that I want to talk about today, and it's on your reading list, Shannon, uh, Boy Snowbird, um, uh, which is written by Helen Oyeyemi. And this is actually based on the plot of Snow White. So while we are talking about retellings of fairy tales, and this was written in 2014, um, these are very contemporary. And um, we have, uh, and I want to talk about this, how we have moved past simply retelling an old tale uh, into uh, using the fabric of the old tale to, be, to weave uh, entirely new narratives in order to convey uh, realities more than the magical, mystical elements of fairy tales from the past. And so my interest in fairy tales is more in uh, how they have been used uh, as a form of communication. And so when I, and I have, um, one, one semester, this class on witches took on the, um, the entire class was about wicked witches and charming princes. And so we talked about the role of Prince Charming as well. You know, if you're interested in the, the gender depictions in these fairy tales, you are equally interested in what becomes of the Prince Charming. Um, and um, um, so in that, in that semester, we were uh, reading Boy Snowbird. Um, Fairy tales, based on Anna Maria had asked about our definition of fairy tales, and I stayed away from it because fairy tales for me are not so much magical and mystical as they are ways in which we convey our realities. We just cover them up. And, and that is why you have uh, more than a thousand uh, multicultural versions of Cinderella. And initially it used to bother me, why just take the same old story and rewrite it? Why not write your own fairy tale? And then over time, I realized why it is so important to take the uh, mainstream um, understood fairy tale and use those fairy tale elements in order to convey the reality of these specific cultures. 
And so there are a lot of, um, and you know, there are so many variations of the Cinderella story, but they are essentially using the basic elements of a fairy tale in order to be able to convey there. Um, so if you read uh, one of the Native American versions of the Cinderella story is called the invisible one. And so instead of Prince Charming, we have, so your perception of all the roles are altered based on uh, which culture is uh, rewriting this fairy tale. So there is the multicultural um, rewriting of fairy tales. Um, my, let me share screen for just one second. And this is, um, oh, here. This is actually a quote from uh, Terry Pratchett. Um, and this is the basis of my interest in fairy tales. Um, where he says, and this is from Witches Abroad, and he says, people think that stories are shaped by people. In fact, it is the other way around. And their very existence overlays a faint but insistent pattern on the chaos that is history. This is called the theory of narrative causality. And it means that a story once started takes a shape. And our, and I, while I think a lot of what Terry Pratchett writes about is just making fun and subversion of uh, what he's experiencing in this, um, in his journey as a writer of, uh, of Disc World series, that is what he's best known for. Um, but uh, I took that very seriously because um, the whole premise behind our understanding of witches and our understanding of fairy tales is uh, who's, who, from whose point of view are we reading the narrative? That also brings us to the whole representation of elements in the fairy tale. And so with Snow White, you always have the mirror. And with Cinderella, you always have the glass slipper. And that then leads us to our um, understanding of the associations we make and our perception of these females, um, largely with objects, whether they be uh, the, the, them looking in mirrors or them being associated with the glass slipper. And, um, Interestingly, um, fairy tales, while they are, if you trace them back, it is easy to simply refer to the male writers. It is um, easy to simply think of the Grimm brothers in the 1800s and prior to the Grimm brothers, you had the you had Charles Perrault, um, uh, the French fairy tale uh, compiler. Now Charles Perrault has been credited with uh, tidying up the folk tales into making them uh, fairy tales, which were more suitable. And later on, Disney actually went back to Charles Perrault's versions rather than to Grimm's because, again, we wanted proper little tales for proper little girls in order for them to make an, a proper entry into a proper world. And, um, uh, and Grimm's was a little too violent and a little too maybe raunchy for, um, for Disney days. And I steer away from Disney um, simply because I really don't get anything from uh, uh, their uh, depictions or, you know, my interest is in these adult rewritings of fairy tales. Um, but if you go back and read, uh, there were uh, female writers of fairy tales in the 17th century, and they were largely, they were called consciences. And they were, these were aristocratic women who were uh, writing these tales for themselves. And they were, they would share them and it would give them an opportunity to, they would challenge each other. So, and, um, and these would, they would be bizarre and they'd be all over. And so they retained that oral quality, but it stayed within that small network. And Jack Zipes is one of the most notable scholars of fairy tales and folklore. And, um, and he talks about how the audience for these fairy tales transformed over time. And for um, up until the 17th century, you, were, you had Charles Perrault, you had these countesses, who were largely aristocratic writing for an aristocratic audience, taking tales that belong to common folk and then preparing them uh, to be suitable for the taste of aristoc uh, aristocratic uh, folks. Then with the Brothers Grimm, and that is the most interesting part, suddenly the female writers or references to female writings of fairy tales just disappear. And there is no reference to female uh, writers of fairy tales at that time. And then, um, then we make a huge jump and um, in the 1960s and 70s, and I want to share screen and show you, I actually gathered these tales together. Um, in the 19, uh, if you look at these, these are, um, 
uh, from 1961, um, Sylvia Plath's posthumous uh, poetry that was released, Ariel, uh, and you'd be surprised that Sylvia Plath was also rewriting fairy tales. Um, and you have Anne Sexton's Transformations, which is just fantastic. And she's taken 17 of Grimm's fairy tales and rewritten them by changing the genre. And so they stop being tales and they become poems. And Sylvia Plath has done the same. Olga Brumus is very little known. And Olga Brumus is also writing in 1977. And her book is entitled Beginning with O. And she also has her version of Cinderella. And I, I cut and paste them on uh, the screen because it's hard to get uh, uh, versions of these poems that I can uh, you know, copy and paste a link in the chat box to. And then you have Angela Carter with the Bloody Chamber and Angela Carter. And there's another one like Angela Carter called Tanith Lee. And uh, they, they came up, but technically, and Angela Carter too is uh, uh, keeping the genre, except if you visibly see what these poems look like. This is Angela Carter's version of uh, here. This is the Snow Child, by, and it literally looks like this. This is the entire fairy tale. And it is, um, there are a bunch of things that are going on in these tales. In, uh, these tales. This is Olga Brumas. And just to look at and a common refrain in her in her poem is, I know what I know. And she's this is a Cinderella story and told from her point of view. She's writing about, apart from my sisters, estranged from my mother, I'm a woman alone in a house of men who secretly call themselves princes, alone with me usually under cover of dark. I'm the one allowed into the royal chambers. And you suddenly have a whole uh, perception of Cinderella, not uh, uh, you know this happy ever after that has happened, uh, and the reality of that happily ever after. And now Cinderella finds herself alone in this house of men and trying to figure her way out and trying to. And she compares herself to a piece of laundry and uh, alone on a string, left out as one piece of laundry strung on a windy clothesline a mile long. And the loneliness of um, these female characters, whether it be, and um, I remember when I was reading Cinder, I would often be bothered by this, uh, you know, the, whether it be the Disney version and, and all, by this very uh, lackluster kind of personality, you know, uh, whimpering, um, waiting. Uh, not really doing much. And yet, and you had this, and what this poem does for me is it brings out the whole, um, the feelings that Cinderella could have had. So instead of Cinderella just being a trope of what proper womanhood uh, should be like, now suddenly Cinderella has come alive. This is, this is the person who is uh, now, um, who's had a happy ever after. And this is what happens when you actually get, this is the long rewrite of um, the Grimm's, Snow White by Anne Sexton. Mm -hmm. And she felt the need to make it into a poem rather than, and, uh, and this is something that we just uh, read last week for my summer class of the switch narratives. And um, what all the students responded to is just this portrayal and they, they have now learned how to read the ending and interpret the entire poem. The portrayal of Snow White as a China doll, mm -hmm. uh, porcelain, those are the associations, you know, fine wine, uh, fine French wine. And those are the associations that we are making with, uh, because that is how she had been seen. You know, she was this, um, and then comes the ending and the most fascinating part of the ending. And this is the newer trend in the rewriting of fairy tales, where earlier the, the, in rewriting these fairy tales, the attempt had been to redefine the role of the feminine, right? To uh, sometimes Jack Zipes has a book called Don't Bet on the Prince, uh, you know, do away with the prince altogether. You know, uh, now we are, this is a story about women, by women, and, and there was all that kind of rhetoric. The newer trend, um, and this was picked up later in the 90s again, was in making the connection between the queen and Snow White and that they were actually mirroring each other rather than the mirror being a representation of the male gaze. Mm -hmm. So the mirror wasn't just how women were supposed to. Interesting. Well, the mirror, in this case too, and this is how it is uh, ending up. And you see at the end of Anne Sexton's poem, Snow White is on the verge of becoming the evil queen. Snow White mm -hmm. held forth while the evil queen, the witch, and that's another interesting fact, how the witch, always has this brutal death, 
at the end of fairy tales. And it has to be brutal because the point has to be made about why that aspect of femininity has to be demolished literally for the, uh, the proper little Cinderella and Snow White uh, predetermined in a way lives and you know the values that they should have. And so you have while Snow White held court rolling her China blue doll eyes open and shut, sometimes referring to her mirror as women do. And, uh, and, and then you're thinking, but Snow White is going to be just like uh, the evil queen. So the idea was to diminish these uh, clear boundaries between what are good women and what are bad women or what is good and what is evil and, and, and then relate them to each other rather than divide women uh, to actually bring them together. And this is Sylvia Plath's um, uh, poem is actually called Mirror Mirror and uh, uh, Mirror by uh, I'm Silver and Exact and it is told from the point of view of the mirror. Mm. And this is how the mirror, um, what the mirror sees and how people come and go and how the mirror sometimes and I think for me, fairy tales are not just, uh, let me try to stop share. Fairy tales for me are at one level, they are representations of the societies in which they are being created and retold. Uh, but at another level, fairy tales are means of making sure that we conform to uh, certain ways of and certain anticipations uh, of various cultures and, uh, and societies. And that is why when you read the, cultural rewritings of fairy tales, that is what you notice most. Different cultures, different values, yet same moral about how to behave. Um, just a few words before uh, about voice no word before we end. Um, so if you haven't read this, and this is on Shannon's list I saw, uh, voice no word is um, based entirely on the Snow, Snow White plot, um, Boy Novak, and, is uh, the Snow White character. Uh, no, Boy Novak is actually the evil queen and Snow is uh, Snow White and Bird is uh, another character. Bird is Snow White's uh, sister. And uh, the whole narrative is based on, uh, she's taken the, that story and not just merged the boundaries between genders, uh, but also the boundaries between or reflective of the themes in our society. So we have themes of, in this case, you have themes of racial identities and suddenly you realize and Snow White has a whole other level of interpretation based on um, the being the fairest and uh, being white as snow. And so there are se several other novels that have been written on just that very fact on the, uh, the colors in Snow White and what those colors represent. And so it's a fascinating read. It makes us rethink all over again about you know, who is who. And so is the evil evil enough? Is the good really? And one thing that connects both Witches Abroad and um, uh, Boy Snowbird is that both of them at the heart of uh, they are challenging uh, the power of stories. They, they are, and so Witches Abroad is about these three witches which are, who are on a trip to prevent Cinderella's happy ending. You know, they do not want Cinderella to end up getting married to the prince because Cinderella is being forced uh, based on another narrative and another witch who, is, uh, who has that uh, narrative where she ensures that this has to be the ending. And so both of them are writing against the necessity of happy endings. And um, so interesting things. I hope you read some of this material. And, and these are newer. Um, these are from 2014 or uh, uh, Witches Abroad is from 1995. Um, so around that time, so they are newer. So you've had a look at uh, poetry entrenched in the feminism of the 60s and 70s. And you had uh, more modern works, um, uh, novels largely that are rewriting these tales to convey cultural messages. I will pass it on to Carrie. I, I will interject that, um, like I said, I will send out a resource list after this, but I deal mostly with contemporary fiction here at the library. And there are just so many authors that we recognize that have done different versions of this, like you said, you know, uh, famous books. Um, it's just amazing how many authors um 
give a try to the fairy tale or folklore. Carrie? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Carrie. And um, so I, I teach uh, writing for young people at UAB. And, and also I write a lot. So I, I've, on my, my talk is more about um, just some of the, the way the authors approach the material. Um, but I also do teach my students to write cracked fairy tales. And so that's always been, that's like once they do get through some picture books, then they have to all write a cracked fairy tale. Um, and they always do come up with some amazing, hilarious and, stories. And what does that mean, cracked fairy tale? Uh, like they take, like, like they take, they'll read a fairy tale and then they'll just change it to switch it up. Like King Midas. I remember one girl wrote about King Midas got obsessed with everything he touched turned into macaroni and cheese. <laughs> so they, so it's, it was hilarious. And there's a, lots of things like that. They'll play with um, the, the standard, you know, Snow White or Cinderella and then, and then switch it around. So um, gotcha. that's a typical cracked uh, fairy tale. Um, and then I also, when I began writing stories um, set in the Smoky Mountains, um, I this woman, uh, a professor came up to me and said, you heard of the jacktails? And I'm, I had no idea about the jacktails, but those are Appalachian folk and fairy tales, kind of like Jack the Beanstalk, but always with the moral and Jack is always getting into trouble. So I, I learned about the jacktails. And so those are things I'll introduce to the students. Um, so, so one of the first books I'm going to talk about is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, and I'm, I'm not. It's it's been one of my most favorite books this year. Um, so I she um, she is she became obsessed with Hamnet at the age of 16 when she was introduced um, by a, her professor uh, who who told her that you know Shakespeare had a son. And, and when he died in, I think it was, it was 1596, about five years later, they produced, he wrote and produced Hamlet. And she said at 16, she remembered covering the, the, the letter, you know, of the name. And so she just felt like Shakespeare's son. Um, she says, uh, the engine behind the book for me, Hamnet, was always the fact that I think Hamnet has been overlooked and underwritten by history. I think he's been consigned to a literary footnote. And I quite strongly believe that without him, without his tragically short life, we would not have the play Hamlet. We would probably not have Twelfth Night. As an audience, we are enormously in debt to him. So she um, she couldn't write it because she right away because she had three kids and she was very superstitious and she was terrified to write it while even though she said I knew my son would not probably die of the black plague of the black death <laughs> I waited till he was after older than age 11 to finally she kept writing other things in the middle of writing Hamnet um, but it's the story of Shakespeare's son and um and so he and he also had daughters what she also talked about was that her daughter, his da Shakespeare's daughters, and one of his daughters, Judith, lived to the very old age of 67, and um, whereas Hamnet died at age 11. And she said, just the beginnings, his early biographies were coming out, and no, but nobody thought to go to Stratford and interview his daughters who were still living. And she's like, ah, oh, what a waste, what a waste, because there would have been so much material. Um, so, um, but she also wanted to set right talking about just how the women's voices in in stories and and getting she she said there was just this understanding that Anne Hathaway was this hag this older strumpet who who lured this boy into marriage and she wanted to to change that in Hamnet so Agnes uh and she he she calls her Agnes um is this fascinating character who uh like she, the first time uh Shakespeare sees her and he's never mentioned by name in the novel. He's like the tutor or the son of the glove maker. Um, he sees her with a kestrel and uh, she went herself as an author as a to, to do research and learn to fly a kestrel. She went to Stratford um, uh, to, to walk around the house where he lived. But she also she wanted to set right, you know, that that Anne was way more than that. And she had so she grew um, uh, Elizabethan herb garden, um, and she, you know, did all these things that she imagined that 
that uh, Agnes did. So, um, so it's just this, it's, it's also just about what it's like to lose a child. So um, it, it, it was incredibly powerful. Um, and I just thought they also describe um, Agnes is kind of like, she has to move in when she, when Shakespeare married her at 18 and she was 26, she had to move into the house and she kind of became a, a Cinderella of the household and was like doing all the work and like raising the children and helping with Shakespeare's siblings. And then his mother was, they didn't get along. So it's, it's very, I just found it so contemporary and so beautifully written. And she really captures the sight smells and relentless daily toil of Elizabethan London. Um, so that is, it, it, that's, and she makes it a love story. And so I just, I just think, and then she also, the way she writes about the Black Plague, you really, if she moves into this omniscient voice, that's incredible. So that's, that's, you know, when I think of retelling, I, I, I listened to this first and then I read it, but I just walked around the, 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 the audio is incredible. So you just, you feel like you're just transported back in time. Um, the other book that I, that my daughter, uh, Nora got me very much into is Circe. And I just, I, Madeline Miller, I was fortunate enough to hear her talk, um, a few months ago and she just talked about she was a classics major and she didn't know that she was allowed to retell the stories until she began directing a production of Troilus and Cressida and she's like oh I'm because and so she and, and so talking to the actors talking to the direct to as a director she was like able to mine like what were the motivations what were the you know what you know what was the story and she's like maybe I could do this do this as a classics major and she so she worked on her first book song of Achilles for 10 years and told no one because she was afraid that her classics professor you know would get mad at her <laughs> so but then she just she just you know became she realized she she had to tell the story of Achilles um and so um she said um she said from the so this is one of the quotes about the book from the epic celebrating the glories of gods and men Miller spins a tale which ultimately celebrates the fragility of humanity and the incredible force that is womanhood Circe is a recreation as well as redemption and I just what what's she also Madeline Miller talked about um with with Song of Achilles she sort of chose the lyric poetry in telling it where she could be the it personal and sort of the domestic you know like the love story but with Circe she went she wanted to go epic with the so she could really capture the men at, you know let a woman have the story that, that that has always been consigned to men in history um she thinks these retellings it's just so because the, the women's voices were so silenced at that time um, she highly recommends Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey. Um, she said it also took her, it takes her five years to find a voice of a character. Um, it's like tuning an instrument. She, somebody called her a method writer as opposed to like a method actor. Um, but we are completely in uh, Circe's head. And she also turned to, um, she said that uh, in reading the Odyssey that Circe was, uh, was a lot, was this flat character of a, a witch who turns men into pigs and she was consigned to two two chapters of two chap 2.1 chapters of the odyssey as a cameo in 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 it and so she's like i'm going to make odysseus a cameo in Circe, and so he gets 2.1 chapters so there are just these fascinating conversations and she just basically gave herself permission to, you know she said homer is going to be fine i can re i can i can begin to write this. Um, so those were just, I just got obsessed with that. And then um, another, I could, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about that. Um, also, she just talks about the timelessness of these stories, women being sexually assaulted, belittled, kept from the halls of power, all the things that, you know, we're stealing, still dealing with today. Um, so highly recommend it. And she talked about, I'm going to also send, include on the list, her favorite writers are um, that she, Lori Moore, Margaret Atwood, Isabella Allende, um, getting into the magical realism, um, Virgil, James Baldwin is her by far her most favorite. Um, so those were all her influences as she, as she was writing. Well, and Carrie, then, yes, I will say, um, 
So we're broadening the scope of what we're calling fairy tales because we're including mythology, we're including legends, we're including um, folk tales. And especially when you start talking about uh, authors from other countries, they bring their own legacy, their own, uh, you know, Isabella Linde and all these, uh, you know, they bring their own uh, flair, their own unique fairy tales, folk tales. All of these are just st stories that have lived for ages, in other words. Exactly, exactly. And just going off on that, the last book that, even though this is not a fairy tale, this is Prairie Lotus that just came out uh, by Linda Sue Park, who wanted to, who imagined herself as Laura Ingalls Wilder's best friend, but wanted to tell more of American history than was being told because she thought that was an unfinished part of, of this world and what it would have been like to be an Asian American growing up in North Dakota. And so um, so she, and also she wanted to present a different view of Native Americans than Wilder did. So this is a wonderful middle grade book that captures, that, that's a retelling of the Little House books that, that she says is something she's been writing all her life. Um, and I also have brought in two guest writers who are working, going on, talking about legends and myths and fairy tales. So um, if, I know that Judith Teitelman has to leave, but she is, uh, her book is Guest House for Ganesha, which um, Judith, it's Judith's first novel. Um, she was a finalist for the Penn Emerging Voices Fellowship. She's won so many awards for this. She's an, she was been working, she worked on it. It was like her heart novel inspired um, by her grandmother, but also Ganesha, the Indian God. And I'm gonna let Judith talk some more, but just taking, you know, what she did to, to recreate the story of her, of her own history. So um, I'm gonna introduce Judith and then I'll introduce Diana Wagman. Is Judith still with us? She yes, may have right had here. Me. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, good. I just need to leave a little before uh, 5.30, but I, first I wanna say, I wanna take all your classes. <laughs> <laughs> This is not enough time to learn all this. So thank you so much. I'm so inspired. And, and just in brief, Guest House for Ganesha, the spark for it. I, I call myself yet another accidental novelist. I never intended to write creative fiction. I've always been a writer and I've published many articles and essays and such, but in the nonprofit sector, which has been my business for 40 years, uh, but in 1984, at my maternal grandmother, at the luncheon after my maternal grandmother's funeral, uh, it came out that my grandmother, who had always been this mean, nasty, really horrible woman, and we all assumed, I'm, uh, I'm first generation American, my family's from Germany and Poland, and we always assumed it was, it was the war. She had lost 90 plus percent of her family. She was separated from her children. She lost her husband, et cetera, et cetera. But my great aunt, my Tanta Tonka had come from Berlin. And when somebody started bringing up one of my cousins, my grandmother's nasty personality, um, my Tanta Tonka said, well, you know why don't you? And we all said, assumed to the war. And she said, no, when she was 17 years old, she was standing under the wedding chuppah, the wedding canopy in the middle of their village, waiting for her beloved to come. And he had run off with the richest girl in the village. Oh no. And my grandmother, Esther was 17. She never got over it. She, not long after she left Poland and the rest unfolded and she remained Stoic and mean and relentless and pretty horrible her whole life. But it also made her a survivor. While most of her family died in the war, she did, she survived. And so at, at that luncheon in 1984, I thought, now there's a story. Never imagining that I would ever do anything with it, but life takes you in directions that you don't anticipate. And Guest House for Ganesha. I was dragged in the early 2000s into a, a writing class and Guest House for Ganesha um, started to unfold. And I knew if I had to delve into my family's Holocaust history, I had to do something for myself. So I coupled the story with East, the East, 
and Ganesha, which is part of my own interest and passion. So actually the tagline for the story is left at the altar spurned. What does that do to a young woman's heart and why would a Hindu God care? So that's the background in a nutshell. Thank you, Judith. That's awesome. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. That's so it's and it's wonderful. And so this is extraordinary October. This is Diana Wagman who's here with me and her first YA. She's written five novels, she, regular uh, op ed uh, columnist for the LA Times. She teaches all over um, and from UCLA to everywhere. And she's fantastic. We've known each other forever. And I'm real. I love this book. So inspired by her daughter. Well, Hi, everybody. And this has been so great. So wonderful. I love fairy tales. I love folk tales. Um, I think writers are drawn to them because plot is the hardest part to write. And a story like Cinderella or Little Red Riding Hood, it has the story there. The arc is there. The things that Little Red Riding Hood learns, you know, it's all there for you. And easy to adapt. I mean, we look at film, right? They use all the old tropes, all the old um, plot lines. This book, because I love fairies and my daughter loves fairies um, and she believed in them much longer than she probably <laughs> should have. <laughs> and she was teased mercilessly at elementary school. She believed there were a group of them that lived in our backyard. She talked about them. I said, you know, you could just not say anything, but she had to share and um, the kids were mean to her. And one day she said to me, wouldn't it just be great if it turned out I'm a fairy <laughs> and I'm a half fairy, half troll and I could fight back. And that was the idea for this book. So it was her idea. Uh, it's a much older kid in it um, who discovers right before her 18th birthday, all these weird things begin to happen to her. She can talk to animals, um, fireflies appear, and we don't have those in Los Angeles. Um, you know, various things. She's followed by crows, these weird creatures are fighting after her and um she discovers she's half troll half fairy and heir to the kingdom of both you know so she's got to go to fairyland and fight the witch and there's a witch um because there's always a witch right um so there's a witch with a secret that turns out to be also half fairy half troll but the worst half of fairy and troll, as opposed to my character, who's the better half of fairy and troll. And they have to come, they have to figure it out. I am I'm fascinated by your, your take on the fairies. And I notice I've, I've read a lot of, of YA and adult. I noticed a lot of themes where they're given a normal childhood for a length of time. Right. Even in Harry Potter, you know, they, they come of age at a point and then it's yeah. revealed. They do right. that a lot in, in the um, new series that they brought out. You know, it's like they can't handle it as kids. So, you know, that their powers are revealed when they, you know, right. interesting. Well, and I think because um, puberty is such a scary time and um, school is such a, can be a very scary place to think that you might be special in some way is really attractive to young people. And, and to, on the flip side is being different, which you don't want. Right, you don't want to be different, but you want to be special. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I tried to use some of those things more than follow a fairy tale exactly. Like she's not really on a quest. I mean, she does have to figure out why this is happening to her, but it's not like, get me, th answer three questions or get me three dragon's teeth or something. Um, and the only wise old woman 
there is no wise old woman. <laughs> so, you know, it's not that kind of fairy tale. That's, that's for the next book. That's the, <laughs> yes. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with the book too. Sure. Sure. And um, now I know Carrie, um, you, you're dabbling too in writing something that has uh, otherworldly uh, origins. Um, will that be another children's book or YA well, or? It's a middle grade novel that I've been working on a long time, but it's evolved over the years, but it's more, um, it's a it's about addiction and werewolves and I, and 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 werewolf how the werewolf is sort of a, is the sort of the symbol of addiction in the family and so um, the little brother is obsessed by werewolves and he thinks his older brother who's going off the rails is actually a werewolf and it's so and so it's I'm writing it for the nine year olds who who think they can fix addiction in their older siblings so and it's so that's so that I'm so and it's called werewolf Hamlet so I am I am looking at Hamlet too he thinks Hamlet would also be better with werewolves so that's interesting yeah. we've, we've got a question a, a statement and a question from Emma who evidently the speakers know Emma Fox she says uh, she writes YA historical fantasy blending history and folklore. What a, that's a tough job, but I love reading those. Yes, and um, you know, magical realism, fairy tale retellings. There's going to be a lot of that in the bibliography I send you. Um, mine is all adult fiction. Um, you know, as far as you know. These these speakers are probably the experts in uh, giving you some some recommendations. Um, oh yes, Children of Blood and Bone is an excellent one, and they're going to make that into a series. And what's the one you've got, Aparna? Uh, this is the one. This is uh, called Marvelous Transformations, an anthology of fairy tales and contemporary critical perspectives. I'll put this in here too. Oh, gotcha. Is called. What about um, Discovery of Witches? It's not really YA, but it's so historical. That, and that and book is fascinating to me because the author is a Shakespearean scholar, am I right? And so when she talks about witches and that setting and time frame, she knows her stuff. Aparna, right. have, have you looked much at the Discovery of Witches? Just one second. Uh, sorry. Uh, here is the title of the book for Emma. Um, oh, good. Thank you. Oh, that's great. You can look it up, and it's uh, it has many of the rewritings of the fairy tales too. Um, so you were asking me about uh, um, Deborah Harkness's uh, Discovery of Witches series. No, I'm not familiar with that. Um, oh, you've got to uh, read the books. Um, it's three books, but um, you know th there's time travel, but but they get taken back to Shakespearean times. And th there's a lot about the concept of time travel. There's a lot about Shakespearean time, but it's also about the love between a witch and a oh, what's what's her her it's her a vampire, isn't he? A vampire, yeah. And they have made this into a mini series, which I'm, I'm obsessed with a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, that, you know, her being a Shakespearean scholar, the details are just spot on. You know, you, you can, you can uh, enjoy it all the more. Her period details are great. Oh, and um, Anna Maria, you brought up Scott Westerfeld's Levi Leviathan series. That's good. Yes. Anyone else have any suggestions? Um, have we missed anybody talking? Um, I think we've covered <laughs> everyone, all five of our speakers. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, Cersei's power. Oh, Louis, Louis Gluck. I, do I know that writer? You He's a, I think he's a poet, right? Oh, it is. Yeah. 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 But um, thank you so, so much, each and every one of you. 
especially Aparna, I, I, I'm, I'm like, can I audit your class? <laughs> <laughs> on witches I really really like the sound of that oh yeah Naomi Novik she's got a, a several different of her books um, based on fairy tales I enjoy those thoroughly so if you have any suggestions for me for the library to get but we we've got a ton of these that we've mentioned and um, and I know that I was going to say Carrie I joined why would a librarian join another outside book group? I run two book groups, but I joined Literati, which is okay. this new upscale social uh, media thing that where all these famous people talk about the books you read. And this month's book is Hamnet. Oh, that's great. And it's, um, oh gosh, Susan Orlean. That's who, who my, my, uh, my guide is to this book. So I'm excited about reading Hamnet. Oh yes, Melanie, thank you. Sarah Moss, Court of Thorns and Roses. That's Beauty and the Beast, right? And uh, Winter Night Trilogy. That's one I don't know as well. Well, thank you so much for bringing fairy tales alive for us talking about the importance and history and, um, you know, hopefully it'll inspire some of you as writers or inspire you as readers to take part. And uh, I thank you all for joining us. And if you have any other questions about these kind of books, find me in the fiction department. I'm always there. <laughs> and thank you. Us, thank you, Anna Maria Aparna. So good to see all of you and have a Thanks. great evening. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you all. This was Bye. great. Thank you.